Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our town hall on long-term care. My name is Kathleen McKenney. I am the city councillor for Somerset Ward in Ottawa and your host and moderator for this evening. I want to thank you all for taking the time out of your day to join us for this conversation on long-term care. I am so encouraged by the number of people who have registered this evening. Actually went over a thousand today. Uh, so, so welcome. Um, the COVID pandemic and its devastating and deadly impacts on long-term care pulled back a curtain on the almost incomprehensible lack of sufficient care and safety planning for both residents and staff. In Ontario, we lost more than 3,700 long-term care residents and 11 staff in the first 14 months of the pandemic, more than three quarter of the total cases in the province. And we lost more seniors in the second wave than in the first. This can no longer be ignored, except that we know that governments at every level move on from crises, but we cannot move on from this one. We can no longer ignore the fact that the system is broken and elders are paying the price. The report from Ontario's Long-Term Care Commission released last week, as expected, criticized the province's lack of preparation for a pandemic and decades of neglect, leaving long-term care especially vulnerable. One that we could anticipate would have devastating effects if it ever reached long-term care after SARS in 2003. The commission stated that the province's lack of pandemic preparedness and the poor state of long-term care of the long-term care sector were apparent for many years to policymakers, advocates, and anyone else who wished to see. The report goes on to make a clear case for transformative cultural change in our existing long-term care homes. And I quote, leaders at every level must put their hearts as well as their minds into reimagining the care of the elderly in this province. This will require a philosophy of care that is anchored in respect, compassion, and kindness for the people who live and work in long-term care. It is not just about building more homes, there needs to be a transformation to a person-centered care model, which motivates different behaviors and rewards innovation that leads to better outcomes for residents and staff. So there are many aspects of long-term care that require our urgent attention. Who delivers the beds and the care? How do we ensure that sufficient uh, level of, that there's a sufficient level of home care within that spectrum of care? But tonight though we are, mostly focus on the commission's call for transformative cultural change in our existing long-term care homes. My responsibility as a city councillor is to ensure that the four long-term care homes operated by the city of Ottawa, who is actually the largest nonprofit provider of long-term care in Ottawa, continues to lead the way on elder care. But we can only do that if we, we also adapt the models of care in our homes because now more than ever and within a pandemic environment, there is a pressing need to change the system so that residents and long-term care homes are safe, comfortable and live a dignified life. I'm looking very much forward to tonight's conversation where we have an exceptional opportunity to hear from experts who are leaders in this field, who have been investigating the problems, speaking up for elderly residents and making the changes that provide us with the answers to how we can transform the homes that our most vulnerable elderly residents live in today. I wanna to begin uh, by asking Rick Baker, who is the president of the Ottawa chapter of CARP, who partnered with me on this event uh, to say a few words. Over to you, Rick. Thank you very much, Catherine, and good evening, everyone. Thank I'm so pleased to bring greetings from CARP Ottawa's Volunteer Board of Directors. We are a strong, passionate and committed 13 persons constituting a collective of retired seniors and active professionals who've all worked with seniors in the long-term care sector. We are so proud to work in collaboration with Councillor Catherine, Catherine McKinney to put on this long-term care town hall. We have an excellent panel of inspiring speakers tonight. CARP Ottawa has close to 11,000 members who we serve in the planning and execution of numerous programs and services. Members are rewarded 
with discounts and benefits on over 100 everyday products and the Zoomer magazine they know and love from our trusted affinity partners. We work collaboratively with numerous senior organizations in the Ottawa area, and we support each other with the goal to make life better for all seniors. We are also aligned with CART National, who represents over 320,000 members across Canada. This past year, with the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have hosted numerous virtual seminars and presentations to keep our members engaged and informed during these difficult times with topics like fitness for seniors, seniors tips on scams, Ottawa public health and the rollout of the vaccine, elder abuse, fall prevention, long-term care and advanced care planning. We plan to continue these types of sessions until we can meet again in person. Over the last two years though, as a board, we've chosen long-term care as our number one advocacy priority. Under the leadership of Kathy Wright and her team of passionate volunteers, they have put together a very active grassroots campaign called Transformation of the Long-Term Care Culture in Ontario and the promotion of a number of excellent models like the butterfly model. With this key advocacy project, we have a reach out to many chapters and organizations in Ontario and we have also presented a briefing to the Ontario Government's Commission on Long-Term Care. As you know, the Long Ontario Long-Term Care Commission just released their report and recommendations 58 and 59 recommend that the Ministry of Long-Term Care should actively promote and provide funding for homes transitioning to recognized alternate person-centered models of care. The report includes commentary from members of our panel tonight, who we will be more formally introduced. Our team is committed to work with the City of Ottawa to, to promote this important element of change. Let's keep this movement alive and well. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. And thank you for all the work that you're doing. Now, I'm pleased to introduce our keynote speaker for this evening, Andre Picard. Andre is the health columnist at the Globe and Mail, where he has been the leading and passionate voice for the, those most impacted by the pandemic, including residents of long-term care. His current bestseller is Neglected No More, The Urgent Need to Improve the Lives of Canada's Elders, where Andre reveals the full extent of the crisis and offers an urgently needed prescription to fix a broken system. Good evening, Andre. Hi, thanks uh, for the invitation and thank you for that very kind introduction. So uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. So it's really moving to see how many people have joined online uh, that the interest in this area that's so urgent to fix. So I, I'm glad to be able to weigh in on this topic, talk a little bit about my book and some of the larger issues. So I'm gonna speak briefly. I'm gonna try and set up uh, the night for a more in-depth discussion with your excellent group of panelists, including a couple of my journalist colleagues who I, I greatly admire. So I saw two polls recently. One of them said that 90% of people never wanted to go into a long-term care home. Uh, the other one said that it was only 85%. So these numbers are actually no surprise, um, especially given the carnage that occurred during COVID-19. Uh, people were doubtful about long-term care before the pandemic and now they're downright fearful and often for good reason. Uh, there's about 24,500 pandemic deaths in Canada to date and roughly 17,000 of those occurred in these institutional settings in long-term care and retirement homes. So they, they can be frightening places. And that doesn't even count the collateral damage, the, the isolation, the loneliness, deconditioning, decline. All these things occurred uh, in large part because family caregivers were locked out during the pandemic. Uh, that impact was also devastating. It's hard to calculate, but we know that people you know, literally died of loneliness and, and neglect uh, during the pandemic, never mind the virus. Now, no one wants to lose their autonomy and be dispatched to an institution, even at the best of times. Uh, this sector is never going to win a popularity contest. It's not Disney World. You know, these are tough things, getting old and frail, etc. But some institutional care is necessary. And I think what we have to do is ensure that 
the best possible care is provided to our elders. That has to be the goal. Uh, in fact, I think one of the key challenges and goals has to be ensuring that every Canadian gets the right care in the right place at the right time. And that applies not only to acute care, but to chronic care and to elder care. And what that means is structuring the health and welfare system differently, uh, creating programs that allow everyone to live to their full potential, regardless of, of where they live. So in, in other words, uh, we have to prioritize quality of life. And we, we don't do that enough. We provide services. We don't think about quality and, and quality of life, and we have to. Now, overall, I think it's fair to say that we're failing our elders, that they've been systemically neglected for decades and decades. You know, the generation that gave us our beloved Medicare system has really been forsaken by it. And we have to correct that for a whole number of reasons. And none of you, what I'm going to tell you tonight, or probably what you'll hear from the panelists, is new. Uh, this has been one of the most studied parts of society for a long time. Uh, there have been more than 150 government-sponsored reports written about the shortcomings of, of Medicare and about elder care in particular. And the last week alone, there have been two reports published in Ontario. Uh, you heard about the Long-Term Care Commission, and there was also a report of the Auditor General. Uh, both of these reports were quite damning, and both of them had the same conclusion, the conclusion of every single report, that the neglect of elders is systemic and unacceptable. So let's fix the damn system. That's what I say in the introduction to my book. That has to be our goal. That's a blunt message. We have to stop talking about this. We have to stop pointing fingers. We have to stop passing the buck, and we just have to roll up our sleeves and fix it. Now, assuming the horrors we witnessed during the pandemic finally give us the impetus and the backbone to do this, where, where do we start? You know, there's so much to do. Well, I think we have to start with a fundamental change of attitude. We have to adopt a philosophy that we value our elders and we want them to remain active members of our community. That countries that deliver care well have this philosophy. They're committed to it. They believe in people living in society, uh, in the community as long as humanly possible. So once you have that goal, once you have that philosophy, everything else is actually relatively simple. It's all about technical implementation. Uh, to me, if we create a really good blueprint, then you just have to do the building. You have to do the plumbing and we can do that. Uh, countries have done it. Uh, we've done it on a small scale all over the country. We have a lot of successes. Now, there are about 400,000 elders living in institutional settings in this country. It's one of the highest rates in the world, but it's still roughly about 7% of people over the age of 65 are in institutions. Uh, we still have the vast majority of people living in the community and we don't pay enough attention to them, uh, making sure they stay there. But it's that group that's you know, funneled off to the side uh, there. I, I call it in the book, I call our practices of long-term care essentially elder apartheid. We take people out of the community and we put them off in these buildings often hidden by, by the highway, by the Queensway, big buildings where they're out of sight and out of mind, uh, stripped of your citizenship. And that, that shouldn't be the, the default setting uh, when your health declines a bit. The default setting should be, we're gonna do everything for you to keep you in your home. And if you can't be in your home, uh, maybe we'll get you an apartment building. We'll provide care there. But the last resort is going to be this hospital-like institutional setting. So if we want to do that, practically, it means shifting not only our attitudes, but shifting our spending, uh, shifting from long-term care to home care. We really underinvest in home care in Canada. Too much of our home care is just a, an extension of hospital. It's about acute care. It's not about chronic care. Uh, we have to invest more in affordable housing for elders so they don't go to institutions by default. Uh, we need community supports, everything from public transit to Meals on Wheels to community programs to combat isolation. Now, I'm not suggesting at all that we don't need care homes or congregate settings. Of, of course we do. Uh, like many of you, I've had parents with, with dementia. They needed 24-7 care. It wasn't possible to do it at home anymore. But we have to do that care differently. We have to offer person-centered care, emotionally focused care, not the assembly line care that we do now. 
Now, Moira Welsh, who's one of the panelists, uh, she's written an excellent book that focuses uh, largely on models of care. And I'm sure she'll talk to you about these in, in more detail, things like butterfly care and dementia village or some really excellent models. And I think part of your discussion tonight will be, how can you incorporate these into municipal homes? But all this to say, homes have to be built purposefully. Uh, and you know, we have to have a vision of what kind of care we wanna provide and to who. Uh, we know that the vast majority of residents of long-term care have some cognitive decline or right up to dementia. But very few facilities are actually designed for their needs. Uh, there, for example, with spaces to wander safely. A lot of people with dementia wander and they should be able to do that safely indoors and outdoors. Uh, so we have to build homes for the needs of people, uh, not build homes for the needs of real estate companies. Uh, homes should also be, well, they should be home-like. You know, we have these 200, 300 bed facilities. Uh, they look like prisons, they feel like prisons. I won't tell you what they smell like, but I think many of you know what they smell like. They shouldn't be like that. Uh, they should be like our homes. They should be welcoming and comfortable. Uh, you know, we can build slightly larger facilities with pods, but they, they just don't have to be BMOS. Uh, care homes, as I mentioned a couple of times, should really be in integrated into the community. Uh, again, in many European countries, they pair long-term care homes with uh, daycare facilities or schools so that kids interact with the elders, so that they're part of the world. They're not just uh, shunted off. Uh, one of my favorite quotes in my book is someone who says, uh, governments think that old people only want to talk and live with old people. And it's not true. They want to be active members of society to the end. So that integration into the community is really essential. Uh, elders shouldn't be invisible in our daily lives. Even people with dementia, we should be seeing people with dementia every single day and recognize this is a normal thing. And we should be adapting our our cities and our communities to their realities. Uh, there's no downside to being inclusive, to building accessible cities. Everyone benefits from mothers pulling, pushing strollers right through to, to elders who need walkers. So the question I get asked most often when I talk about this is, well, where do we start? And I think you have to start where the biggest problem exists and that's in staffing. Uh, healthcare is a people business and we need sufficient number of people to provide care. Uh, there's a lot of talk these days about providing standards of care. You know, for example, uh, guaranteeing four hours of hands-on care to every person in an institution. So that's a good start, uh, you know, but it also has to be funded. You can't just mandate four hours of care and then pay for only three. And that's a situation that we have in a lot of this country. It just, there's not, it's not properly aligned the funding to the expectations. I mentioned infrastructure a couple of times briefly. Uh, Moira will talk about that much more later too, but you know, we have to start by getting rid of ward rooms, uh, three and four people to a bedroom, uh, eight people sharing a toilet. That, that's not how people want to live. That's not dignified. It's not respectful. Uh, and we have to start those changes now. Uh, ownership is an important issue. Uh, there are for-profit homes, not-for-profit homes, and municipal homes in Ontario. The municipal homes are, of course, a particular interest to this audience. Uh, uh, that's what we're talking about in part tonight. Uh, these days, there's a big ban, a big push to ban for-profit homes. Now, I don't, I don't think we need for-profit homes, but I also think it's a simplistic solution to a complex problem. Uh, we know that for-profit homes had worst outcomes during COVID, but if we look next door to, to, to Quebec, Quebec, Quebec has almost no for-profit homes and it actually had a worse death rate from COVID. So it's not a magical solution to this ownership issue. Uh, the Ontario Long-Term Care, Long Care Commission, which released its report on Friday, uh, it actually had a really interesting recommendation on this issue. It said we have to, to separate construction and ownership from the operations of the homes. And I think that's a really important thing to, to underline. Uh, it's not really sound public policy to have real estate developers delivering long-term care. And that's what we have in actually the majority of homes in Ontario. It makes absolutely no sense. Uh, it's not good for the real estate business. It's not good for home care. And it's certainly not good for residents. So we need a, a system where uh, if governments aren't going to build infrastructure, and that's a fundamental problem, they don't like to spend money on buildings, then they have to contract out the work and they have to lease the facilities. 
but they still have to take care of the daily operations. They can't leave that to, to builders uh, because we've seen the consequences of that. It's disastrous. So bring in the not-for-profit health organizations and then pay the rent on the buildings that they operate. That will deliver much, much better care. Now, personally, I think we need more municipally owned homes. I think that's a really interesting model. Uh, and uh, I think it's no coincidence to me that the best elder care in the world is in Nordic countries. And in Nordic countries, a lot of health services are controlled locally. Uh, being close to the community makes you accountable. There's no question. If you see the person who runs your home every day at the supermarket, they're going to pay attention to what's going on there. And that's what happens in countries like Sweden and Norway. Uh, during COVID-19, I think we should note too that municipal homes had dramatically lower death rates. And there's reasons for that. Uh, these homes tend to be smaller. They have stable staffing, which is really important. And they generally top up funding. They spend more on the care of residents uh, than the province does. Uh, a lot of uh, municipally owned homes have dramatically better food, for example. Uh, the food budget from Ontario is only $9.25 a day. Uh, you don't get great food for that price, obviously. Now, a lot of people say we can't afford to reform elder care. It's going to cost too much. It's uh, just overwhelming. I, I don't believe that. I don't believe that for a second. Uh, we already spend a lot of money in this sector. In Ontario alone, $9.6 billion a year is spent on long-term care. We just don't spend it well. We don't get value for money. We shouldn't be paying to put money in the pockets of real estate developers. We should be spending it on care. Uh, we shouldn't be spending one third of the home care budget on bureaucracy. We should be spending it all on care. So there are better ways to spend our money. Now, one of the reasons money is misspent is because we don't listen to the public and what they want. You know, I've talked a few times about how we funnel everyone to long-term care homes, a place where they don't want to be. The polls tell us that over and over again. So people need choice. They need real choice on where they live out their final years. They don't just need care, they need quality care and they need dignified care. So once you put the emphasis on quality, everything else seems to work itself out. And again, you're gonna hear this, some concrete examples of this from our panelists. Uh, quality is not as expensive as we think. It pays off in spades. The other common excuse for inaction is that there's just so much to do. It's overwhelming, it's hopeless. Again, not true. I don't believe it. Uh, as you can tell from my brief comments, my book is a sometimes harsh condemnation of the care we provide. But I think it's ultimately a hopeful book as well, because I stress some really fundamental truths that we can't lose sight of. Uh, number one, we know all the problems that need to be fixed. We have the benefit of all those reports. We know all the solutions. Uh, 100 and, you know, 50,000 recommendations. We have everything we know uh, to fix, we know how to fix it. And not only that, we've actually solved every problem. We've solved every problem we have in pilot projects, in a small scale, in uh, homes that are, are magnets, that are examples for others. We have some tremendous care facilities. And again, uh, you'll hear about them from Moira, these butterfly care facilities. We just need more of them. We need, and we also need to get rid of the bad ones and replace them. We have to scale up our success, stop repeating our failures. Now, the final thing I'll say, because I'm looking forward to listening to the panel myself, is Canadians have really good values. Let's not forget that. We believe in fairness, justice, equity. That's why we have a Medicare system. We have a generous Medicare system. It's just not broad enough. Uh, we also all love our parents and our grandparents. We want them to live out their lives in dignity, in respect. We want them to be well cared for. And I think what we want individually, we should also inspire aspire to collectively. No one should be left behind. Uh, a lot of, in a lot of circumstances today, you can get good care, but you have to pay for it. Uh, people who can't afford it should still get dignified care. You know, the guiding principle of Medicare is no one should be denied care because of an inability to pay. That's a really good principle. And it needs to apply not only to hospital care and physician care, but it needs to apply to long-term care. Uh, in short, we have to give life to our values. That's really our challenge. So I want to thank you for your attention, and I hope I've provided you with a little bit of food for thought for tonight's uh, community conversation. And as I said, I, I really look forward to listening in and, and learning myself. 
So thanks. Uh, I don't know if you have any questions, Catherine, before we move to the panel, but if so, I'm happy to answer. Thanks, Andre. Um, just coming back on. I see the host is not Zoom. It's not the same as being in person. Um, thank you for that. Listen, you know, in uh, in reading your book, I have to say that probably as with most people over the pandemic, especially, uh, and for those who have had people who they love in long-term care and have been living this or have worked in long-term care, it, it almost feels hopeless. It almost feels like it's, it's too much. Um, but you, know, you, you make the case that you know, we, we continue to spend money on things that don't work. So to, you know, to shift that money to things that work, whether that's housing for people or you know, good long-term care or, or home care, uh, it, it actually can be done. Um, I just wanna ask you, maybe it's a, not a, I hope it's a fair question. Do you have confidence that the, the recommendations that we have in uh, this from this last commission report will get acted upon? I wish I could say yes, uh, but I, I don't have full confidence, but I just, I think the public has to step up the pressure. We have to be, we're not demanding enough as Canadians, to be honest, we're too, too accepting of, of mediocrity. We have this notion that, oh, well, Medicare is free. This is a government program. We can't do everything. And that's not true. We just have to look to other countries around the world. It's doable, it's affordable, and we have to be more demanding. So I think uh, I think the government, uh, to me, the most disturbing thing about the Long-Term Care Commission report was the response from government. It was this silence. You know, yeah. the report was released on Friday. The minister came out on Monday, spoke, took two questions from journalists, and literally fled you know, really fled the room and we haven't heard a word from the premier. That that's a, speaks to their priorities and that's disturbing. And the public has to send the message that no, we, we don't accept this. I agree. And I think the more that we show people what can happen and what, what is possible, the more people will demand it. And uh, thank you. Uh, it, it's just such a, a pleasure to, to hear you speak your book, if people out there haven't read it, um, you have to, uh, it, is, it is really something. And it does in the end, it gives us that, that, that prescription, that roadmap for change. So thank you, Andre. Oh, thank you, it's a pleasure. I look forward to listening in tonight. Excellent. So now we're gonna hear from um, a really exciting group of panelists. Um, Susan Zors, has over 20 years working in the long-term care sector and is currently the Director of Operations of the Gleep Center here in Ottawa, where she manages resident programming and has started implementation of the Butterfly Model of Care. Welcome, Susan. Next we have Mary Connell is the Dementia Advisor and Project Manager for the Butterfly Model of Dementia Care in the region of Peel. This was the first butterfly home implementation in Ontario, and she is thrilled to be on the leading edge of this revolutionary change for people living with dementia and their families. We're thrilled to have you there. Moira Welsh is an investigative reporter with the Toronto Star. She has written extensively on seniors' issues with a focus on long-term care. Moira has co-authored investigations that have won three national newspaper awards and a Michener Award for public service journalism. She's the author of Happily Ever Older about evolving ways to live in our later years. And it does give you hope. You know that there can be change. Mohammed Adam, Mohammed's with us. Hi, Mohammed. Mohammed is uh, with the, as a Canadian journalist and commentator. He works at the Ottawa Citizen, he's worked at the Ottawa Citizen for more than 25 years as a reporter and member of the editorial board. Mohammed has traveled widely around the world and has over 30 years of experience in journalism and communication. Now retired, he writes a weekly column for The Citizen on a variety of local, provincial, and national topics. Welcome, Mohammed. Mohammed and I have known each other for many years. 
So I'm going to throw out the first question to, to all four of you. Um, as Tanya would have it, we just, uh, you know, um, a week ago Friday, we, we had the uh, Long-Term Care Commission report um, that was released. And I just want to, I just want to ask each of you to, to give us your thoughts on, uh, on the commission's uh, report. We'll start with you, Susan. Thank you, and thank you for the uh, invitation to be here this evening. Um, I'm um, encouraged and hopeful. <laughs> uh, I'm uh, ho encouraged and hopeful for change, um, and I'm hoping that um, with the focus in the report on person-centered, emotion-based care, we will see some support and change for that over the, the coming years, and I'm also uh, I'm hopeful for changes in staffing. I was encouraged with the mention of the value of allied staff who sometimes get forgotten. Um, a lot of focus is on PSWs and nursing and rightly so, but there's also another group of people who work and are very, very important in the lives of our, of our elders. Excellent. Uh, Mary. Um, I would, actually my response is a matter of public record because Moira actually wrote yes. about it. <laughs> <laughs> she did. So when I read it, I, I wept because uh, kind of like we're speaking about now, four years ago when we started the Butterfly Project, um, a lot of people didn't have any hope that anybody would buy into that. And here we are tonight, a thousand people listening to it. So I have, I cried because I have tremendous hope that uh, it will change. And Nathan Stahl said today on the Advantage um, conference that he doesn't want to fix long-term care because it's it's in such a bad state he wants to reimagine something wonderful and that's what i'm hoping for excellent i'm maura oh thank you the the report was very hopeful and we shall see what the government does with it but i think the key point for me was when they did speak about person-centered care being the foundation of all of their recommendations in the report i think that um, validated all the work that people like mary connell and jill knowlton and other people i've been writing about for years now um, the work that they've been doing but the key point for me is that when we talk about changing long-term care we can have the extra hours of staffing, which are very important. We can do a lot of, you know, create a lot of changes, perhaps around household models and so on. But if we don't have person-centered care in a substantive way, we will never truly transform the homes and the, and the long-term care system. So for me, it is the underpinning of everything. Absolutely. And Mohammed, your thoughts? Yes, um, I thought the report was very, very comprehensive, um, but it was not surprising really. What everything they said, if you've been following uh, the, the sector, you know, you, you know all about it. I mean, it's been said over and over and over again. The hope is that since this is Ford, the Ford's commission, he will do something about it. I'm not hopeful. I, I, I don't think the government will do anything. I don't think governments over the years have been serious about uh, long-term care. Uh, they, you know, they just park seniors somewhere and they forget about it. So I think it depends on the public. And, and what I'm hoping is that this issue will become an election issue, that somebody will pick it up. It's a party. If, if the government doesn't do anything, we have to make it an election issue, all of us collectively, the advocates, the media. That is how we're going to get change. That's, that's how I see it. Absolutely. We do move on from crises. And we, we can't let governments move on from crises. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. Um, Moira. I'll start with you because you know in in reading your book I mean a lot of things struck me I was I was joking with you early on and I'm glad I read your second um, because it, it does give hope and we're going to hear from Mary and Susan on how they have shifted their models of care and what that looks like um, but one of the things that struck me was uh, Dr. Thomas who talked about 
you know, the most dangerous thing to the status quo is is reporting uh, that shows that it can be different. And, and, and I don't think we do that often enough. I think that, you know, we, we talk about what's wrong and it's not until we show people what's, what's really possible. And, and your book has done that, done that so well. Um, so let me, I'll start with you. If you could, you know, you, you have written extensively on, on new and innovative person-centered models uh, elsewhere in Canada. Uh, we're going to hear from Mary and Susan on what they've done in, in their homes, but if you could just give us some examples of what you've seen that uh, that succeeded. Absolutely, and I think that's a really good point. I, I purposely and happily ever older showed stories that were showed uh, told stories of homes that are actively um, working with seniors in a, a really successful way. And so I looked at many homes. I traveled across North America and went to the Netherlands. And in the Netherlands, I went to two homes. One was the Hogevik, which is the village model. And it has small connected households with the opportunity for a lot of freedom of movement outdoors and very um, individualized living for seniors. People can have a glass of wine with dinner if they wish. They can go sit in an outdoor cafe if they choose to do so. So it gives people autonomy over their lives. And not too far away, is the city of Deventer in the Netherlands. And I went to Humanitas Deventer and they offered an inter intergenerational life. So they gave university students free rent in, in exchange for their community spirit with elders. And that really created some interesting relationships and a different understanding that across the generations that really benefited people young and, and old. And in um, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, beautiful community called Carol Woods Retirement Community. And that was um, built within a forest of what I call soaring oak trees. It was absolutely stunning. And people there had a very interesting philosophy. It was a very active community with a lot of volunteer work. There were 80 committees. So there was no activation work on site. The residents themselves determined what they were going to be doing, but they were very inclusive of people with cognitive decline. And so I met a lot of people who had fairly significant dementia, but they would be out gardening. Um, they hiked through the forest. They were very much in touch with nature and each other. And then in Atlanta, a lovely home where workers were given the freedom to care for resident, residents in very creative ways. And what I saw were really deep relationships between residents and staff. And that's the key piece of relationship-based care as the interaction, the, the friendships that it creates and the, the naturalness. And again, um, I, I went to a, a day program in San Diego, which was really, really interesting. And they worked really hard to give enriched opportunities to people through arts and music. And that was really important because that actually helps delay the entry to long-term care. It helps families and it helps the residents. Um, another lovely home was Sherbrooke Community Center in Saskatoon, and their philosophy is basically people trump tasks. So if ever there's an issue comes up where you're supposed to be doing a job and a human being needs your help or needs some attention, you go to the person first. They had an artist in residence, a beautiful art studio where people would discover this innate talent that they had. They had elementary classrooms and intergenerational learning. And what's really interesting there is that they have plans for an intergenerational community on their front lawn. And I, I will let Mary Connell speak about the work that Peel Region has done. Thanks, Moira, for sure. I mean, I think that it's, we often think that other countries can do things for a variety of different reasons that we can't hear, but we actually have that. We have examples right here in uh, Saskatoon and, and uh, here in Ottawa and, uh, and in Peel. Um, maybe I'll start with Susan uh, from uh, the Glebe Center here in, in Ottawa. Hi, Susan. Hi. Um, hi, it's nice to see you again. I was like, maybe you could tell us about some of the changes that you've implemented. I know that you can speak to that, that it was delayed somewhat with, with COVID, but just about the changes that you've implemented in, in your long-term care homes and uh, what it took and what it's taking to transform the culture in, in your homes. 
Right. So um, I'm at the Glebe Centre, which is a long-term care home in, in Ottawa. And as a home, we decided um, a couple of years ago to um, strategically align ourselves with the butterfly model of care, although we certainly recognize there are there are other models that people may want to, um, to focus on. But we... Um, uh, decided that we would we would jump on board with uh, the Meaningful Care Matters folks in the UK. And um, we really recognize that Butterfly is not a program, it really is about culture change. And we were re very committed at our home to put the well-being of residents first and to provide the type of care and services that really connect people to where they are in their life journey right now. Um, we listened to the feedback from our, from our care teams, and from our families and um, specifically the care team stated um, over and over again that they really wanted to spend more time with residents and less time on tasks. They wanted to feel less rushed and really be able to put people before paperwork that has been discussed this evening. So in 2019, we did launch uh, our butterfly model, uh, as I mentioned, with our with our consultants from Meaningful Care Matters. And our first step was to transform one of our home areas that we call Banquet. Um, and part of the transformation was the physical transformation of that home area that included bright colors uh, in the in the hallways and um, personalized front doors that, that that every home needs a front door concept that's so important. Um, we created simulating wall murals, some interactive things, um, just really created a home area that um, that had the stuff of life in it, things for people to engage with throughout, throughout the day. Um, and also, um, you know, place to also be have quiet time. Sorry, that's my dog. I don't know if you can hear that or not. <laughs> I followed up some spaces and um, things like puzzles and music, of course, uh, couches to sit on um, next to a friend. Uh, we have a, a little kitchenette in our in our dining room so that people can help themselves to a uh, pudding or cookies or whatever, whatever, make a cup of tea, that sort of thing. Um, but in January of 2020, we actually started the education with our staff. The um, easy part is changing the, the paint colors and putting things on the home area, but the difficult part is, is the next step, which is really about changing um, hearts and minds of the people who, who work in long-term care and really getting away from that traditional medical model of care. Um, we were able to get through three of our modules and then of course the, the pandemic struck and we had to put a stop to everything and it was shocking how fast uh, things reverted right back uh, to the extreme in terms of the medical model of care that has been mentioned this evening as well. But in the sessions that we were able to do, we really started to discover how we can make meaningful um, moments with the people who, who live in our home. And we also dis, um, really discovered how we can start collaborating as a team and really looked at the value of life stories, not just with our residents, but but with ourselves. Um, we started to introduce staff to the idea of, um, of seeing um, staff and residents um, as friends and challenging that hierarchy of, of them and us. And we, we also really look critically at the language that's commonly used in long-term care, such as um, I'm going on break and we have 254 beds and really challenged ourselves to um, think about how that sounds and the impact that that has mm -hmm. on the people that live and work there. And we asked ourselves always, would we use this at home? And, and if the answer was no, then it doesn't belong at the Gleep Center either. Um, and so we also had a chance in those sessions to really talk about our fears, our concerns. Uh, you know, we have the same issues every other home has in, in the province um, with funding and with staffing and all of those sorts of things. Um, but we decided that um, we just needed to move ahead as we could uh, with what we had and just get on with it because we felt it was that important. Um, 
So at this point, uh, we are starting to restart. I've had a number of people over the last few months say, when are we going to restart Butterfly Susan? And so we're taking small steps um, to, to do that. We are uh, have always been in contact with our consultants and we're hoping that, uh, you know, maybe early next year they can come back and we can start our education, but we're still working with them very, very closely. Um, we're still keeping Butterfly alive and well in our home through um, small huddles with our team, uh, bulletins, a uh, butterfly bulletin that goes out every, um, every month and so on and so forth. Um, but the other thing that probably has changed the most is really the issue of IPAC and person-centered care and really um, understanding that IPAC and person-centered care must go hand in hand and remembering that we are a home and a family first. Absolutely. I remember when you spoke at uh, committee at, uh, at the city and, and you did, you talked about, and I was struck by that, how um, language and just the language you use uh, makes such a difference for people to feel like they're at home and not in an institution or in a hospital, but they actually are living in, in their home, which, which right. they, they are, and how that then translates itself and, and leads to just better center, you know, person-centered care. So, well, thank you for that. Yeah. Thank I can't you. wait to go in and see it when we're able to. Yes, that'd be wonderful. Thanks. Um, so Mary, Mary Connell, um, now Mary, you've converted five homes, am I right? Or at least five um, over to Butterfly? Um, so the region appeal has five homes. Okay. But within those homes, um, so Malton Village, we have converted two home areas into butterfly homes. Okay. And Sheridan Villa um, has two home areas that are being converted into butterfly homes. And uh, I'm just starting one in Bolton. But before I talk about that, I just want to say that I have the honor of being here tonight and you know, being the front of uh, the Butterfly Model for Peer, Peel, but there are literally hundreds of people back at Peel that are making this happen. I just get to be the, the front man. Well, we thank <laughs> all of them. Yes. <laughs> we do know that it's people behind us that, that make all the difference for sure. Absolutely. Um, yeah, if you could just talk about what the most challenging part of the, the culture change was for you in, in implementing uh, this new model of care? So um, my background, as well as being a registered nurse, uh, I am also a change advisor. So I, I know this just from doing my job that very often leadership is the most challenging part. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was true in this case. So for frontline staff, they get it. Um, they see the immediate outcome of the model in the care that they give every day to the people that they love and care about. And I believe people are in long-term care for that reason. Um, one of the, the challenging things about leadership is um, this model really flattens the hierarchy, yeah. right? And um, we just teach leaders to be measured in a certain way. So they're worried that they're not meeting their outcomes and their measurements, you know, this little list of tick boxes they have every day that they need to get through, which is the leadership version of the task the PSW mm -hmm. is doing, by the way, um, that that is hard for some leaders that you're challenging the status quo and the way that they have operated for decades. And then someone's coming in and saying, no, we think there's a better way to do it. And then within the model, you're having discussions and meetings and sitting around a table and in that um, forum, the PSW has as much to say and as much input as the medical director or the RN or the administrator of the home, and this is difficult. But we know from change management that 99% of change uh, that does not work is because it doesn't have visible leadership that backs it 100%. So if you're gonna do this, you have to have somebody leading in the home that as Susan said, leads with their heart and uh, believes in it 100% and is ready to take on some of those fights that quite frankly happen quite a bit from some of our regulators, right? Um, we always 
play within the rules, but uh, you have to push, you have to push a little bit. Absolutely. So leadership was definitely the most challenging. Interesting. And to be fair, I mean, that's the way people have been expected to, to work and how we've asked them to work for so long and then to, to shift that, right? To away from the status quo. Absolutely. I just know I just noticed Mary in the in the chat uh, that a few people have just asked and I I know that Susan certainly uh, did a good job of, of explaining butterfly model but a few people have said like what exactly is butterfly model and maybe it's because and I know I struggled with this too at first when I first started thinking about it talking about it it's not that it's so simple it's not so simple I don't want to I don't want to um, imply that uh, you know to put in place but it's just such a uh, a common sense model. I think that 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 people often think there's there's more to it. You could just yeah, just kind of give us a just a walk through what you do to to get from institutional to butterfly. So it's based on a social interaction model. So you bring two people together uh, that are going to develop a relationship. In this situation, of course, it's people who live in the home and staff, and all staff, not just care staff, um, and the outcome of that relationship is mutually beneficial. So in a way, yes, uh, Catherine, it is extremely simple because we have relationships with people uh, throughout our life. I have a relationship with the young woman that checks my groceries at Loblaws, but you see people in the home don't have that type of relationship. We've made it very task focused. We don't reward them for, for that outcome right? We reward them for doing things that are very much opposite of developing a relationship. So what the butterfly model does, and we do a lot of work before we ever show up in the actual building, working with leadership, getting them to understand what the model is, what they have to do to support their staff, because it's challenging for some staff. Not everybody, you know, not everybody has it in them to do this for a variety of reasons. And uh, then we bring staff in and we do training. That to me is the absolute most critical part of the model um, that you need to change the way staff feel about themselves as caregivers and how they think of the people that are in their care, that it's a relationship. And what you start to notice, and I started to notice very quickly into the implementation was the close friendship that developed. Staff would come in and say to me, oh, you know, I was at Walmart on the weekend and I picked uh, Victorine up socks because I knew she didn't have any socks and you think wow but if you start mm -hmm. to spend yeah. that kind of time with someone five days a week eight hours a day you're going to develop a great relationship so if you have um, staff that are really person-centered and emotionally focused the other stuff will just fall into place if they love them and care about them like that they're going to worry about IPAC practices and I saw somebody ask what's IPAC so that's uh, infection prevention and control practices, you know, PPE and washing your hands. So you'll do that just like you would for your new baby or anyone in your own family. If you care about them as human beings, this is what will happen. Um, the things within the home that you see that most people notice about butterfly, like the colors and the doors, those are things we set do to set people up to be successful in that environment. Um, they're just uh, props for staff. The real crux of it is having emotionally intelligent staff that want to have relationships with the people who live there. And that's really what the butterfly model is about. Absolutely. Thank you. I see some um, links have gone up. Uh, thanks, Moira. I've noticed some links have gone up. So anybody who's interested, and of course, the book really walks you through it. So if, uh, if you haven't got it, I, I go down to the library or, or pick it up because it, it really does give you that, um, uh, it, it tells you exactly what it is and it, it just gives you so much hope that we can actually, we can actually do this. Can I just um, add something? Yeah, Catherine? absolutely. What the butterfly model has become in the established homes over COVID is kind of like a, a safe place or a, a lovely place to be because in that butterfly home they don't know there's a pandemic going out there and I find as a human being when I want to escape um, you know what I'm seeing on the news and the the things that are happening I go into that butterfly home and they're playing tennis in the in the dining room they're baking cookies 
uh, they're planting seeds, they're singing, they're playing the piano, you would never know. So it's it's a really great environment for them and for staff. It's a good break. For yeah, them. yeah, and for staff as well. I think that's important to remember. Thank you. Next, Mohammed. Yes, Hello, Mohammed. Um, yes. How are you? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, can you I hear see me? It? I can. We can see you yes. and hear you. Before I go on, can I ask uh, both Susan and Mary a question about the butterfly? Uh, thing. This is relatively new, right? And how challenging is this for staff? What is their role um, in, in, in this new system? What kind of training or retraining do they need? Uh, and, and, and how much investment do you put in this thing? Because sometimes we forget the staff. Can, can, can they answer, explain this a little bit for me? You want me to try it, Susan? Sure, go ahead, Mary. Okay. Um, so it's new to Canada, Mohammed, but it's not a new model. It's existed in the UK for 25 years, which says something about the sustainability of that, that model. Um, and for training with staff, what, what we did, and uh, Meaningful Care Matters supports you with this, is we did eight full days of training for staff, and that was all staff from facility staff, kitchen staff, care staff. And it's really exper experiential training. So what we do is we give them a little bit of classroom content. We send them out to the home to practice, um, you know, the, the piece that we have given them and we monitor how they do. And we bring them back in and say, so how was that? So uh, family meal time is an example of that. Before we implement the model, we send them out to the home and we say, okay, sit down, and have a meal and come back and tell us what that was like. And most people come back and say, that was one of the, the grimmest experiences I've ever had. You know, white tables, white plates, white fish with cauliflower, no music, no sound, staff shouting over people's heads. And what it does, that experience gives them insight into their role um, in that environment. But the other thing we do, we talk about so what do we do to make that better? What can we do to make that a better experience? And so they give us the suggestions or the, um, you know, what needs to be done. And then we say, okay, so let's do that. And then we go back out to the home and we make those changes. And then we bring them in a couple of weeks later and we do another item. But it's always about experience and how they experience as a human being, because that gives you the perspective of what it's like to live there. Would you mm -hmm. say anything else, Susan? Would you have anything? No, I think that's that's great. I know that uh, one of the most impactful, unfortunately, we only got to do three out of the eight sessions, but our third session was an observation um, where our teams um, sort of sat for an hour and know who gets to sit for an hour, right? But really just observe what was going on in the home. And that was so impactful on the staff. They, they never have had a chance to do that. And they saw um, good examples of care. They saw neutral examples of care and they saw some care that they were not particularly proud of. And as Mary said, that experience, they brought that back and it just was, it was just um, really mind changing for many, many people. Yeah. To Thank you. I, I think it, I think it is really important to, to remember that that staff are are as much a part of this relationship. Mohammed, you're always a, a journalist, always wanting to ask the questions. Yeah, I, good I one. Know. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mohammed, when you and I spoke, we spoke yes. about something a bit different because um, um, these models of care is not something that you've 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 been uh, writing about, but. We talked about, I think there were recommend, there were five recommendations that, that in a commission report that called for a new model of long-term care development that, that removes profit from the operation of, of long-term care. And it, promote, like it proposes a model more similar to what we have with hospitals, a type of P3, but mm -hmm. uh, that the operations would be mission-driven as opposed to profit-driven. Do you think it's possible? Do you think that uh, that we can we can do that? You see, that's the part of the commission report that I was uncertain about. Uh, the whole idea of person-centered 
care was terrific. And, and the fact that they talked about removing commercialization from, from, from care was very important. But I wasn't sure about the prescription. See, because are they, were they talking about PPPs or a hybrid or something else? I wasn't very clear about what they were saying. Because if you take the hospital model, if you take hospitals, you, we know that the Royal Ottawa was a PPP project, right? Mm -hmm. The new hospital we are, we are considering in Ottawa, the new Civic, is not a PPP project. Exactly. Now, light rail, our light rail is not a PPP project. So I was a little bit confused about what exactly they were recommending going forward. Um, are they recommending private sector, they build the homes and then what, turn them over to government and then mm -hmm. they come into some kind of agreement, whatever, mm -hmm. over 30 years, 40 years, they recoup their costs, they get some profit and everything returned to the government. I don't like PPPs in long-term care. I think yeah. if that is what they are recommending, I'm totally opposed to it. It will not work. We don't want PPPs in, in, in long-term care. Now, the fact is also that we can't get rid of the private sector in, in long-term care right now. We have to live with it. 58% of the homes are, are privately owned. You know, they are, they are run by private companies. So how do you get rid of them? Right, it's, it's very difficult. We have to find a way to hold them accountable, right? There has to be a way to hold them accountable. I think that is what, I didn't hear a lot about that in the report. Maybe uh, um, Moira and others who, who, who follow this more, more focused than I am, can can and give us some sense, but because I really wasn't sure about about um, what they were recommending, and if it's PPP, I don't like it. Um, I yeah. just don't like PPP. In, in uh, I think at the, at the very least, we can agree that operations need to be mission driven as opposed to profit driven. Yeah, right. Like we can't we can't continue down that road. Yeah, it's gonna take some time. Yeah, yeah. No, I take I. I hear you. Thanks, Mohammed. Yeah. Thanks for asking the question too. <laughs> um, Moira, if uh, I wanted to ask you uh, what you uh, what you say, and I'm sure you hear it. Uh, we all do. Uh, to homes that say, you know, now just is not the time for change. Um, why is it? Why is it so easy to to hold on to the status quo? Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay, great. Thanks. Sorry about that. No worries. That's a really good question. And the reality is a lot of people don't like change. People, it's comfortable to hold on to the status quo, especially if you're a leader in a field and you've been working that way for decades. It makes sense to you. It is what you know. So what we're seeing is a shift, however, I would say among some people who are willing to step up and uh, speak out about the benefits of this. So the challenge is people keep saying in Ontario anyway, there are too many regulations. These programs won't work here. We can't do this, we can't afford it. And so they, they don't, they stop considering it flat out. 30, as we say at the end of a news story. Um, but, but it's time to change that. And, and I think a lot of people now are um, widening their perspective and certainly the commission's uh, report on person-centered care, I think has sort of forced people to look at it differently. And I'll give you an example. One of the top bureaucrats in the Ministry of Long-Term Care was on an Advantage Ontario seminar or discussion yesterday morning. And she said, whether this means anything or not, but she did say, that the fact that the, the commission recommended person-centered care as the foundation of its report um, meant a lot, basically. So that went a long way. Does that mean that the, the government will act on it? No, it doesn't mean that. Th those are words right now, 
but they certainly resonated with a lot of people. So the, the point is, and I, I think the point of my book was to show that this can actually happen. These are is not magical thinking. These are programs that are happening across Ontario, across North America, and so on. And they're working in um, jurisdictions that have not transformed their regulatory system to embrace person-centered care. They're doing it in spite of it all, and they're succeeding um, exceptionally well, I might say. And so that's, that's the point, is to show that it's being done, it can be done, and there's no reason any longer to say we can't do this. Mm -hmm. Do you think part of it, and ask maybe Mary and Susan later as well, is people worry about it will cost too much, change costs. I mean, I'm always struck because, you know, or, the, or that we don't have the evidence to show it works. I'm always struck by that because we, we have the evidence to show what we're doing doesn't work, but we make that shift into something and, and worry about what it will take, what it will cost, and, and what if it fails. Well, we have the evidence to show that it works. We have for, for many, many programs, we have quantitative, for example, for the greenhouse model. And in yeah. fact, the greenhouse model, uh, more quite recently, the JAMDA, the Journal of American Medical Directors Association, came out and did a study from small households like Greenhouse and found that they had very, very low um, infections from COVID during the, the first wave of um, the pandemic. And, and so that shows the impact of these smaller households where you have dedicated staff. So we know, for example, Butterfly does not have independent research, it has qualitative, and it also has internal um, data from outcomes within homes. So we know, for example, that um, residents have uh, their, their uh, the so-called responsive behaviors, as uh, the system describes them, have been diminished considerably. And that's because in many ways, people who live in these homes are not sitting, as I always say, staring at the floor. It's sort of a metaphor for the, the emptiness of their lives. But mm -hmm. they're actually um, engaged in activities that have meaning to them as individuals. And they have the ability to move around in the home and, and, and so on. So you're looking at um, lessened so-called responsive behaviors. You're looking at better satisfaction among staff, fewer sick days. Um, and greater retention in staff, among staff. And if you consider the fact that going into the pandemic, there was a great shortage among frontline workers for long-term care for all the many reasons. If you imagine if workers were actually able to have jobs that gave them autonomy, made them an equal and important part of the care team, allowed them to make decisions around the emotional care of the, the residents, you could attract more people and you would retain more people. And then you would therefore save um, in the cost of retraining people, which is very, very expensive. So those are just a, a few examples. But we also know um, a, a exposure to nature um, is good for us. Yeah. It helps us sleep. Um, that's a big deal. When I was in North Carolina, I saw that as an example of people outside. And there's a story that I'd like to tell um, of a man who was a resident there and he was in the CIA in his career. And um, as we all know, people with cognitive decline um, relive very vivid periods of their lives. And so he was in um, the habit of every day getting up and going for a long walk and the volunteer residents would go with him to make sure he was okay. But he would come back and then report to the CEO in her office and tell her if he saw snipers and if they were taken out and you know, if there, any bombs went off and then tell her that she was okay to leave. And the, the most profound point of that is that she said to me, imagine what he would have been like if he was locked in a memory care unit and, and unable to move. And the fact is like any of us, if we're sort of left inside a static place, we would become agitated, angry and, and lash out. So that's the change that these different models offer. It's the, it's the freedom to exist in a, in a way that we normally would. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting that, um, yeah, I mean, I, and I think that, I think that today now, after coming through the pandemic and seeing some of the horrors that we did uh, to know that we just can't continue to do the same thing. And we have examples where people are happier why not use them? Yeah, yeah. simple. And, and if I can add to that, the one um, an interesting point was the, the um, chair of the Long-Term Care Commission spoke yesterday at the same conference 
Frank Morocco. And he said, mm -hmm. we don't need to study this anymore. He said, yeah. we don't need any more studies. We need to act now. So, Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think almost everybody would agree with that. That's, we do a lot of studying in this, this province and this country. Um, I think, Susan, maybe we can um, look to you to talk to us about um, just building on, on what Moira was saying, just the, the need for ongoing evaluation of, of the programs in place and, and what indicators. And I know that, you know, you've, you've been through what three of the, the 12 models, am I correct? I think I have that. And, but, but what are the right. indicators? Yeah. Yeah. And I just, what are the um, just, uh, just wondering what the indicators are that, that you look for too in your home with both your staff and, and residents. Yes, uh, Moira touched on, on some of them, um, but when she was speaking, it reminded me in my latest edition of the Butterfly Bulletin at the Glebe Center, I, I posed a challenge to our care teams about thinking about what are the three things that matter most to them and if they found themselves in care, what would those three things be? And how would those, how would, would they be able to be actioned so that they had the quality of life that, that they would want? So, um, and, uh, you know, a lot of it is just really about making meaningful moments. Um, it doesn't have to be really complicated. Sometimes I think we overcomplicate things uh, and therefore it becomes overwhelming and, and it's just easier, I think, to answer your earlier question to stay in the status quo. It doesn't have to be complicated. Um, mm -hmm. But in terms of indicators, um, we really just uh, look at what we're already collecting as part of our, um, our compliance from ministry calls, whether they're witnessed, unwitnessed, so tracking those things. I think we're, we're losing Susan a bit. The other piece of this is um, really trying to create an environment where Ah, I think we, we lost Susan. We'll come back. Oh, there you are. Sorry, now you're on mute. Oh, Zoom. Okay, sorry about there that. There we go, um, there just, we go. Just, just to finish off, uh, um, just to really create an environment where people want to come to work every day. One of my favorite quotes in the lovely video that Moulton uh, Village did, um, Mary's home was David Sherrod saying, some people um, happen to work here, some people happen to visit here, and some people happen to live here. And that's one of my favorite quotes um, from that lovely video, which I'd recommend. I know there were questions about what is butterfly, and that is such a great 22-minute uh, video on this, on and visual on seeing what it's all about. Yeah, I think somebody put the link up to that. If I'm not, oh, good. I'm trying to watch good. about three or it's, four things here, but it's a it's a and, wonderful wonderful YouTube video. Yeah. Yeah, and and Susan, just I just want to touch on one other thing, just quickly. I know that a few people have said, but you know, it costs money. I mean, it's it's not free, um, and it and it does cost money. Everything does. We know that to reform anything and to make things better, um, and for you, and again, I, I know that I know that it's um, I know that it's early on for you, but you know. Can you just talk about the costs and the and then what that cost versus affordability and, and what that means for for your home? Right. So we um, we've been thinking about this for a while, uh, and we were able to make it happen. There is a, a a fee that we pay to Meaningful Care Matters, which is which is substantial, um, but we felt as a home that 
this is the right thing to do. And we decided we were going to make it happen. We weren't able to increase our staffing or any of that sort of thing. Um, we did have to, of course, replace the care team because it wasn't just PSWs and nursing. It was our recreation. It was our environmental services, our housekeepers, our, our um, dietary aides that are all involved in the education. So there is a substantial cost to that for replacing full day times eight. Um, but again, we're committed and we felt it was um, just, we were just making it happen. Um, the other thing with, with the, with meaningful care matters is that we can, we'll, they are flexible in terms of the model. We can do what we can do. Um, and they're not uh, suggesting that we have to do something that's going to put us in a, in a difficult situation. So, so far uh, we've, we've made it work for us and just in terms of the resources that we have. Yeah. I noted that uh, Jill Knowlton put up and it's a, it's an important thing to remember that indicators are not outcomes, but indicators are well-being. And yeah. that's what we want is, is that's what it comes well down to. Work. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. It. Um, so Mary, back to Mary, um, can you talk about the, the biggest win for you in implementing uh, the model that you did? Um, I would say it was something that we call the, the Mr. Smith moment. So uh, we had done training for, let's see, probably about four months and uh, people were really engaged in the classroom sessions and you'd set them out and they'd do it and we'd talk about it, it was great. And then in between sessions, it just wasn't sticking. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, is this, is this ever going to work? And then uh, we had one man in the home, uh, Mr. Smith. I didn't make his name up. It actually is Mr. Smith. <laughs> and uh, when he, uh, he was a lovely, very gentle man, uh, but very private. And when they used to take him to the bathroom or do any kind of intimate care, he was very frightened and he would start punching. Mm. So uh, we had, uh, you know, WSIB claims and we had staff upset not wanting to provide care to Mr. Smith, although he was lovely in all other situations. So one of the PSWs, a male PSW, um, thought to himself, well, you know what, this man is very connected to his granddaughters and his family. He's very emotionally demonstrative. He thought, if I hug him before I take him to do any of this, will that make a difference? And uh, so he tried it. He gave Mr. Smith a hug and then he just walked along to the washroom and there was no, there was none of this. So did that work every time? Uh, pretty much. But before the butterfly model, would a male PSW ever have thought, if I hug this man, um, will there be a better outcome? That is the moment that I knew that they got it. That was the biggest win for me. And when his colleagues saw that um, he did that, Moira wrote about him, uh, Ken Roy, in her article, um, it, just, it just started to roll. They thought, well, if Ken Roy can do it, I can do it. And then they were hugging all over the place. We found that very hard during the pandemic not to hug because our people are used to hugs. So they, you know, they hugged us anyway. But um, that to me was the, the biggest win. That was me knowing mm -hmm. the staff had really changed, the culture had changed. Yeah, and if we think about what we want for people we love, and yep. long-term care for ourselves at some point, perhaps, it's what we want, right? That's what we're looking for. Yeah, I appreciate that, thank you. Can I add something, Catherine, about what Susan yeah, said about the cost and that, that the cost yeah. for the model. Yes, of course. And I don't want this to get in people's way, because I always say to them, what is the cost of not doing it? from a human perspective, yeah. but I understand what people are saying. Um, there's two types of costs associated with the project. So there's the one-time costs of doing things like painting and any kind of construction you need to do to adapt the environment. So you only do that mm -hmm. once, it's not something you're doing yeah. every year. And then there's the ongoing costs related to staffing, if you need to add staff, because at um, Sheridan Villa on Spruce Lane, I didn't add any staff because of the physical makeup of that space, we didn't need to add any. But what I have found um, in dealing with Meaningful Care Matters, that there's a lot of negotiation that goes on there. 
Um, you know, even suggesting homes come together and share costs. Uh, one mm -hmm. of the things we did was um, they, a Meaningful Care matter set us up to be, uh, we have a master trainer who uh, does all of our training. So we don't have people coming over from the UK, although we love them. I would love to have them come over all the time. Um, but we have a, a trainer. So there's lots of different things you can do. Be very creative and don't be put off by the cost because it, I think that, you know, um, they're willing to negotiate because they want culture change as much as, as we do. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, we read about them in, in Moira's book, for sure. That's uh, what motivates them is, is, uh, is well-being as well. Yeah. Um, Mohammed, maybe I'll come back to you. I know you've, uh, you've written Mohammed for a long time, uh, many, on many issues, um, but what motivates you to, to write about long-term care? What has motivated you to do that? Oh, well, basically, um, I think all of us, all of us, most of us uh, have a little bit of a social conscience, right? Uh, we see things, we, th we see things that are wrong and we try to correct them. Uh, we volunteer, we do all kinds of things because this is, this is who we are. And in my case, I, I have a voice, right? I have a platform. And um, I look at um, seniors, right? All of us at some point, will become seniors if we are not already there, right? And, and you look at long-term care, the whole, the whole industry, the whole sector, and it seems to me as if government, and it's not just Ford or, or Win, just government as a whole. I think seniors care is an afterthought. They do everything and then, oh yeah, seniors are there they pack them in 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 these homes i mean barracks basically and then they forget about them right uh, and i thought somebody has to try and give them a voice yeah. that's all so i i've written quite a bit about long-term care because i think i think they need a voice. Uh, the little we can do, if you have a platform, the little you can do, you write about it, you you shed some light on it, and hopefully, um, it will help change uh, change the situation. So that's how I, that's that's how I see it. Absolutely, I think that there's a lot of comment coming in too around how do people advocate? Like what what does it take? We you know we're telling people to to mobilize that, you know, this is the time to get out. You've been around politics a long time, uh, Mohammed. How do people mo mobilize? How do they, how do they make sure that they're out there and they're advocating? And, mm -hmm. you know, some obviously as, you know, as an elected official, I can use a, a platform that I have as, as a, you know, as a journalist, a commentator, you, you know, Moira have, have platforms, but, we need we need more, right? We need everyone to to be working together. Right? Oh, absolutely! How, how do you do absolutely. that? How what what would be your advice to people listening in tonight who want to do more? Basically, each one of us can really do something, right? Mm -hmm. We 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 don't have to be journalists. We don't. The little you can do in your in your small corner, you volunteer to do something. You attend a meeting. Um, you go to a home and, and yeah. ask if you can help. You mobilize if you are in a group. There are different ways of, of, of contributing. And, mm -hmm. and um, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, um, some people write books. Moira and I, they are writing books, right? Yeah. And, and that's part of it. Uh, some people advocate, that's part of it. So I, I think, especially with this commission report, each one of us has to put pressure on the government. Yeah. 
Yes. We just shouldn't think we are powerless. We, including we, the we city, have, including the have, city. Yes, we are very powerful, right? So I think through, you know, forums like this one, uh, town halls, seminars, webinars, whatever, mm -hmm. that's how we put pressure on people, put pressure on our MPPs, right? Mm -hmm. Constantly talking to them, writing, make sure this just another report that gets dumped in the dustbin. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's. Absolutely. Yeah. Listen, I'll, I'll tell you this. Um, I'm, I'm the housing and homelessness liaison for city of Ottawa, for council in city of Ottawa. I think a lot about housing and homelessness. Um, and it was um, Kathy Wright and Barb Shulman from CARP who came to see me. I guess it's well over a year ago now, probably a year and a half to talk to me about a butterfly model. And, and from that advocacy, we're here today and we're, yeah. we're here talking about it today. So, you know, I know CARP does a, a lot of work, but there are, uh, there are uh, groups everywhere. Individuals can, uh, you know, can make change. Um, so for, for people asking about mobilizing advocacy, uh, you know, seek out, go and see what, when we can, of course, go and see what's possible. Um, I think in Moira's book it was just put so brilliantly, like once you know, you know, once you have the good story, um, that's when, you know, you can, you can use that as, uh, you know, that's, that's the, the, the dangerous one because now you know what's possible. And I, I tell people often that um, in the city of Ottawa, I, I, I compare it to when we first put in a bike lane, a segregated bike lane back 10 years ago. Cyclists had no idea what could be available to them, how safe they could be with segregated bike lanes. And as soon as we put in one, people couldn't believe it. They couldn't believe that we'd held that back from them for so long. And now they never want to go on a street with themselves or their children without safe cycling infrastructure. It's the same for everything. And it's the everything. same for, for long-term care here. And I think that, you know, the the more that we know, the more that we know what's possible and the more that we demand change uh, and, and we're not okay with the status quo, uh, the more things will change. So, so we're just about out of time. That was, uh, goes by so fast. I, I've been telling people as, as I've met each of you over the last uh, couple of weeks that I could have had just a panel discussion with each of you separately. So, um, but thank you so much um, to each of you, Andre, Moira, Susan, Mary, uh, and Mohammed, uh, for, for the expertise that you brought to tonight, um, for all of your insight, your, your obvious compassion, your commitment to how we make meaningful change by simply treating uh, elderly residents as, as human beings with, with dignity and friendships. And, and that really is how, how change can, uh, can happen. I wanna thank everyone who, who joined us tonight uh, to hear this, uh, this discussion. Um, we will be preparing, I will be preparing uh, an As You Heard It report, uh, which I will distribute widely and uh, it will be available on my website. But for anybody who tuned in tonight and uh, registered, we'll send that out to you. Um, and uh, now I just want to uh, take a moment to, to close the event with a few photos that were shared by, by Mary Connell uh, with, the, uh, with the permission of residents and, and their family. And uh, we're just gonna put that up for, for people to see on, on your way out tonight. Uh, they were taken at uh, Spruce Lane at Sheridan Village in the Peel region. And uh, they, more than anything, really, truly uh, exemplified, for me anyway, what transformative culture change uh, really means. So good night, everyone. And I'll leave you with these. Thank you.